Good morning. Good morning, Rabotai. For those of you that are listening online, so you don't know that uh, everyone has been singing in here for the last 10 minutes. It's a little bit of a weird energy. Everyone's very excited. It's not even Adar yet, but we're already feeling joy. I think maybe the reason might be because we have a very special uh, birthday uh, here with us today. Yosef Hazaku Baruch, who wants to come to learn Torah, uh, to have breakfast in the class uh, on his birthday, Yishtabach Shemo. Hashem should bless you with the best year ever. You should kill it at school. You should become the star of whatever sports team you're on. Whatever else you're looking for, Hashem should bless you with in spades. Amen. Breakfast in the class is dedicated for a speedy and complete for Ashlema, for our Rabbani Chana, Farchi Chana, Batsema Fega. Please make berachot for her rifuah. Um, someone asked me, what does it mean, make berachot for her rifuah? It means that you say, for rifuah Ashlema, for Chana, Sema, Batvega. Then you have Kavanan, you say, Baruch, Atta, Hashem, El Kedem, El Shakon Yav Baro. I had one guy, I heard him say Shakon four times with my wife. I said, Dachilak, that's bracha, shalvat ala. Don't put that on my wife, you know. That's your problem. You have to deal with that with Shamayim. Right, you say the halach, but at least, but say the halach, according to the halacha, that's a big zechut. Uh, especially the berachah of Shakol, where a person acknowledges that everything is done by God's word. It's not just a beracha on a coffee, it's also a acknowledgement of God's uh, dominion over everything uh, on this earth. Breakfast of the class also dedicated loving memory of Joseph's father, Eliot Safra, Lavish, and Lunishmat, Eliyahu ben Jamila and Yaakov, sponsored by Michelle and Joseph Safra. The week of Kobru, sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you, and your substantial capacity of good today and every day. And as well, uh, dedicated loving memory of Ms. Lily Safra, Lunishmat, Leabat Khana, her philanthropy has reached so many throughout the entire world. And finally, uh, dedicated uh, for the speedy and complete refuah shalimah for Rabbi Eli Abadi Eliyahu Shimon Ben Mazal Fortuna and Hashem send them refuah shalimah bekarov mamash Amen. Okay, Rabbi Tai, let us rock. The pasuk says, "Vayidaber Hashem Moshe Demor." Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, "Daber Ben Israel bekhui teruma." Speak to the Jewish people. Let them take for me teruma means. A donation. First fundraising campaign in Jewish history. Boom. First drive. Moshe Rabbeinu makes a drive for the, beta, for, the, uh, for the Mishkan. And he asks the Jewish people to contribute to be able to build something, something that they all needed. A house of spirituality. God says to Moshe, raise the money from the Jews. Go to every person, ask them what they want to give, whatever their heart's desire is to contribute. Take the tirumah. And then the Pesukim tell us what are the things that we're going to need in order to be able to build the Mishkan. And it lists a thing, a list of 15 different items that we're going to need to build the Mishkan. After listing the list, it says, mikdash. They will build for me a Mikdash, Vishachanti, Vitocham, and I will dwell amongst the Jewish people. Now, here's the pasuk I want to focus on, but I needed to quote you the other ones so you'd know the context of this one. Kechol asher ani Everything that I show you, Moshe, to be able to build this beautiful house for God, et tavnit ha-mishkan, the uh, form of the tabernacle, ve tavnit kokelav, the form of its vessels, vechen ta'asu. And so, you should do. Now, the Chachamim saw in these words, V'chen ta'asu, something that I always feel is super important for us to have as we go into what I call a Mishkan Marathon. We're going to have Tiruma discussing the building of the vessels of the Mishkan. We're going to have Titzaveh discusses some of the vessels, but then all of the articles of clothing, all of the Kohanim for the Mishkan. Then we're going to have a short break in Kitisa, which also has something for the Mishkan, i.e. the Kior. But then we're going to carry on with Vayakel Pekudeh, which is going to tell us about the fact that they built the things for the Mishkan. And they made the clothes for the Mishkan. So effectively, we are on a long Mishkan marathon here. And we're going to try and take some of the lessons from the Mishkan and make them uh, something which is attributable and practical and usable, not just... If you are deciding to build uh, in your own spare time the third Beit HaMikdash, but also if you're just trying to live your life as a, a Jewish person lives his life in 2023. And all of that comes in my uh, estimation from these two words. The uh, Chazal tell us, the ta'asu, Hashem says, I want you to build the Mishkan the way I've told you, according to the measurements and the form of the Mishkan, 
and according to the measurements and the form of its vessels. tasu, and so you should do. Say chachamim, one word, lidorot. Can someone translate that word? For generations. So you should do for generations. Simple understanding of that would yield the idea that you know what this mishkan. It's not the final house of God. Hashem already knew if He's commanding us to build the knis, someone else is going to build another knis. <laughs> There's going to be another shul that the one that you don't go to, etc., etc. Jews love to do that. You know, there are some Jewish communities where you have bizor and minyan in one shul. They're already opening up another shul. And then they're calling the people to try and get them to come to their shul. Meanwhile, none of the shuls have a minyan. And what a beautiful thing it would be if they got together. I see people nodding their head. They already know what I'm talking about. She beflitch. Okay. My friends. So, where everyone was going to build their own Beit HaMikdash. Okay. But I think there's a simple understanding, which is follow this recipe. Follow this recipe for the first Beit HaMikdash or second Beit HaMikdash. But then there's an alternate understanding. And this idea is put forward first and foremost by the Nefesh HaChayim. He says, that the Beit HaMikdash, that the Mishkan, was really only ever supposed to be a Mashal. Let me explain what that means. Sometimes when you say something's a Mashal, you mean that this thing, it didn't happen. It's a parable. I tell you a story. And I tell you, you know, this story is a Mashal. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a parable. It's an example. It's a, you know, a metaphor. Then you know that the story is not true, correct? So if I tell you there was once a guy was, you know, on the moon, etc., etc., we learn from here. That story is a metaphor. It's not, that's not, the fact that it's a mashal means it's not true. Not every mashal is not true. Many times a mashal is true, but that doesn't stop it from being a mashal. And what that means is the Nefesh Shachayim is teaching us that the structure, the form, the ingredients, the instructions for building the Mishkan were meant to communicate to humanity for all future generations how a person goes about making a holy space. Let me, let me just restate that. This is not how you build a Bet HaMikdash 101. This is how you build a holy place 101. Mikdash. I will build me a sanctuary and I will dwell in them. The famous teaching of the Al Sheikh teaches us that God said, I'm not going to dwell in the Beit HaMikdash, I'm going to dwell in the heart of every single Jew. Now, most people understand the Al Sheikh to mean that when we built a temple, the temple was only as holy and the temple only held God in its, in its midst, in its center, so long as the Jewish people held God in their center, in their midst. Once the Jewish people forgot about God, walked away from God, what was the Beit HaMikdash? Nothing. It was sticks and stones. That is true. That is what the Al-Sheikh is telling us on the surface level. But I think there's something much deeper. What the Al-Sheikh is communicating to us is that when we had a temple, where did God live? In the heart of every Jew. Everyone came together with their hearts and they built a temple. Like the Pasuk says, Toho Ratsuf Ahava Mibinot Yerushalayim. The inside of it was paved with the love of the daughters of Zion. Okay? So the Beit HaMikdash was a symbol of the Jewish people's love of, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Imagine someone uh, has a person they love very much. They know they love the shore. They go and they build them a surprise. They take them on their birthday. Not Yosef, you're not getting this for your birthday. They take them on their birthday down to the beach and they build them a giant house. Look, wow, I built you this amazing house in this place that you really loved. Look at this, fantastic. Look what I built you. The Beit HaMikdash symbolizes the Jewish people's love for God. But what happens now? They fall out of love, this couple. They're fighting, they're screaming, they're yelling at each other. Do you think she wants to go spend time with him in the house that he built for her? Of course not. It's only a symbol of love when that love still exists in their heart. My friends, but I want to tell you that the al Sheikh's con con concept, the conversation he's trying to get us to have, is not where did God live when the temple was there. What he's trying to communicate to you is that even when the temple was there, where was God living? Not in the temple in the heart of every Jew. And what does that mean? That means that when the temple was destroyed, where would God continue to live? In the heart of every Jew. 
Our Chachamim explained to us that once the temple was destroyed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not have a place in this world once the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. does not have a dwelling place. He lives in the whole world, obviously. doesn't stop being true after the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. Okay? We say every day. The whole earth is filled with His glory, with His splendor. But He doesn't have a special place, a place which is His. A place where HaKadosh Baruch Hu rests. Except for Arba Amot Shel Halacha. The four Amot of Halacha. When a person is keeping a Jewish law, a Jewish tradition, when a person is doing a mitzvah, the space that that person occupies on this earth is a place which is filled with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence. When we discussed the Rambam a few weeks ago, we expressed this idea that Rambam says that when a person does a mitzvah, not because anyone's looking, not because he has any benefit from it, but only because HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded him to do so, in that moment, what is he making? A kiddush Hashem. Because he's only doing this because God said so. That means that this space is imbued with God's word and with God's will. So where does God live? In a place where someone is following in his ways. What happens if I'm learning Torah? Now there's a lot of ways I can learn Torah. We say in Shema, right? When you lie down, when you wake up, right? What happens if God only has the four amot of halakha, but I'm learning Torah on the bus, in my car, hopefully in the passenger seat? Unless I'm in the driver's seat with a Tesla and a bottle of Snapple stuck in the wheel. Okay? Or Spotify. Or Spotify. I'm learning Torah, but I'm moving. Where's Hashem? He's moving. He's with me. Because Hashem has the Arba Amot of Halakha. That space, Arba Amot, Fu Amot, which is a space of eight feet by eight feet, that always, that radius, always describes in Halakha a pinpointed place. So a person's radius of Arba Amot is their space. That's why on Shabbat, when you carry, right? When is it carrying? When you've carried four Amot. Because you've moved from one space to another space. So when you're doing a mitzvah, here, these four Amot, God's here with me. If I'm studying Torah, God's here with me. If I'm putting on tefillin, God's here with me. If I'm covering my hair with a shaitl, God's here with me. If I'm saying tehillim, if I'm eating kosher, whatever I'm doing, I'm bringing God into that specific place. So now we look at the al-sheikh and we see a brilliant concept. We see that the Torah was telling us this world is a place that is missing godliness. Is that true? Is it true? What sells in this world? Don't say it. What do they use to sell products on TV? Unfortunately, they use promiscuity. That's what they use. They put a woman in a, ba- a bathing suit and now they're selling you a car. What does a woman have to do with the car? <laughs> nothing, right? Only time you get a woman with a car is if you're a kidnapper. It's not where, you know, what does it have to do? The answer is they know that they can get you to buy something. That's what gets people to buy things. Who do people want to emulate? The people we hold up, the sports stars. Every week another one of them is getting thrown into prison for murder, for rape, for grand theft laws, or you know, grand theft auto for this, it's crazy. These are the people we respect. I, I don't understand. They're deserving of your respect, why? Why, if they're an actor, why? Because they can pretend to be somebody else. Ooh. Hazaku Baruch. A guy, again, note, I like basketball. I'm very big. You have a guy who can successfully throw a round ball of leather into a round hoop. Ooh. And, and you know what? And I'm not saying this about a small guy. LeBron James just won. LeBron James just won the highest scoring title in the NBA history. If you offered me the choice that I could have one of my kids be LeBron James, I would say, thank you very much. No, thank you. That's not something I value as a Torah Jew. Yes, he's successful. Yes, he has a lot of money. But for me, for you, that's what we value? Is this clear? This world is not right now a place of godliness. It's a place of entitlement. It's a place of selfishness. And when people don't get what they want, they protest in the street, they burn things, they loot, they steal. That's the world, this is the world that we're proud of. This is a world that's missing 
selflessness. It's missing spirituality. It's missing the divine concept, the guidance of what life looks like. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about being a black hat kolel rabbi. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, could you imagine this world valued family more than affairs? Could you imagine this world understood that marriages took work and that not 70% of marriages should end in divorce? Because you saw someone else you liked more. This is the world that we live in right now. Forget black hats. Forget rabbis. Forget super religious people. I'm talking about a father being a father being a husband. I'm talking about a mother being dedicated to her children more than a manny petty. I'm talking about children respecting parents. I don't care if they're white, black, Chinese. It doesn't make a difference to me what creed or race or color. I'm just talking about a world of respect, of dignity, where hard work is valued more than fast money. Someone having the discipline to work on their uh, inner midot, that, that's more valuable than a mic drop, where you were able to diss the other guy. That, oh, that's, that's chashuv, because you made fun of his mother, Hazaku Baruch. So the Pasuk is telling us, Hashem says, I gave you the Torah. I showed you when I gave you the Torah that I could come down from the heavens and be here on earth. Now let me tell you how you keep me here. Do you understand the power of that narrative? Hashem could come down like some alien from space. And we could say, oh, hello, how are you? It's amazing, all these miracles. Okay, bye, we'll be sure to tell our kids about you. Or we could build God, so to speak, a dwelling place here on earth, and then his presence, his power, his goodness, his light, it doesn't need to leave. It could permeate this place. It could stay here. I'm as much into uh, consumerism, I'm as much into capitalism as the next guy. The furthest thing you could ever imagine from a communist <laughs> or a socialist. Free markets, I believe in all, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Republican. Okay? But my friends, listen to me. Listen to me. If we are so obsessed with stuff, that what drives our need for money is stuff. And we throw away our whole life getting enough money to buy enough stuff that, that sacrificed the time that we had with our children, with our families. You didn't even realize it wasn't a sinister or a bad thing. But the difference between the Honda and the, and the Lexus and the Lexus and the Mercedes and the Mercedes and the Ferrari and the Ferrari and the first class seat, and the first class seat in the private jet. This ladder, which never seems to end, by the way. You got your private jet, now where are you going? Oh, I'm gonna to go to the best hotel room. Best hotel room? You should have your own hotel. Just with empty rooms in it. And you alone in the penthouse. Why? Because you can. Oh, you're going to St. Bart's? You don't have your own saint? St. Shlomo Island? <laughs> Are you even working? Do you understand me? It never ends. Where we go never ends. So when we look at a world that has God in it, when we want to build God, the first thing we learn is, The first thing that has to happen is a person's heart needs to recognize that I am not here to get all the monies. I'm not here to win all the vacations, to take all the opportunities, to have more stuff and the newest and the brightest and the fanciest. I'm not here for that. I was born as a human being to be the one species on earth that is capable of giving away, of giving to another. The first step, you wanna keep me here, God says. You need to be like me. God says, you show me. Have I ever taken anything from anyone? You want me to be here amongst an ocean of takers? Now remember, I'm not even talking about when people take the wrong things. When you stole something. 
when you took something that was inappropriate, where you did things that were bad. I'm just talking about the simple nature of self-obsessed narcissistic behavior. I'm just taking. All the time I'm consuming, I'm eating, I'm burning. You understand that? At some stage, God says, how do you want to... How do you want to have a relationship with me when all I do is give and all you do is take? My friends, we need to look for opportunities. But the Pasuk says something beautiful. What does his heart want to give to? Now, if this is not only about the Beit HaMikdash, and this is not only about the Mishkan, but this is about creating holy spaces in this world, then one of the things we need to focus on is realizing that the heart wants what the heart wants. Someone comes and they want to talk to you about collecting money for a kolel in Israel. That might be your jam. That might be the only thing you want to give money to. The next guy, that's the last thing in the world he wants to give money to. But for him, ooh, hatzala. Hatzala is his jam. The next guy, Hatzala, I'm not into it. We already have first aid. I want to donate kidneys. The next guy's like, you know what? Kidneys, everybody's talking about kidneys and Hatzala, and lots of people give money to yeshivas in Israel. You know what I want? I want to talk about Simcha, mental health. Because mental health is being ignored, and it's an epidemic in our community, and that's true, by the way. So many people's lives are being ruined because they're not paying attention and practicing good practice when it comes to mental health as children. And those problems chase them for the rest of their life. That's what I want to give to. You know why? When you give begrudgingly, you gave money. But when you give with your heart and you enjoy giving, you also gave money. But more importantly, you gave a piece of your heart. What do you want to give to? My friends, you got to find tzedakah that you're excited to give to. And by the way, it's not only money. You're cooking meals for somebody in the community that doesn't have. Every week, uh, Remy and Sabrina here in the city, they cook meals, hundreds of meals for people that don't have. Ronnie Dagan uh, involved, v Veronique Hajibe. So many people, they're cooking all the time, they're filling the pantry for SBH, for other places. There's people you don't know. They come to Kiddush in the morning, on Shabbat morning, and they're not taking a lachmajin or two, they're making a plate and they're putting it in their bag. Why are they doing that? They're not feeding the pigeons. They're taking it because they don't have food at home. How embarrassing must that be? Could you imagine if that person would get a meal directly to their house? You might feel that. Now you might feel, you know what? Remy and Sabrina got that covered. You know what I want to do? I want to take care of homeless people. I don't know. What's your jam? Finding something that you're excited about, that you're interested in, that really floats your boat. You've now brought HaKadosh Baruch Hu into Libo. libo. God says, you want me here? You need to donate for me a space to live in. You know, it's hard to find a place to live in Manhattan. <laughs> Where am I going to live? Rent is very high, even for Hashem. <laughs> yes? So where do we let God live? When we find a place of compassion, of generosity, of giving in our heart, a being that is completely giving can dwell in that little part of our life. So we're going to talk this week, hopefully, the next few days, about a little bit of this understanding of building a space for God, of bringing Hashem into this world, bringing Hashem into the home. Because first and foremost, one of the most important things you have to recognize is there is a recipe. That's the hard part. The one food that all men like to make in yeshiva is chalant. Do you know why? Because there's no flipping recipe. What do you put in your chalant? What's in the fridge? <laughs> I remember once a guy told me he put honeydew in his chalant. I was like, what? 
why'd you put honeydew in the chalant? He goes, I had honeydew. <laughs> like, as if that's enough of a reason. We love doing that. Right? You put baking, you put the, what's it called? A barbecue sauce and ketchup and, and uh, onion soup mix and potatoes and onions and beans and whatever meat you could find and chicken and eggs and, and chickpeas if you're Sephardic. And you're putting all the things in. We love making things that don't, don't take a recipe. But anything important, there's a way to do it. And there's a way not to do it. You want to build something important as a home, a place, a space for God, a Jewish home, there's going to be a recipe for that. And we're going to learn over the next few days some of the concepts that create that recipe. But first and foremost, the first step in building a place for God is a person saying, I need to find it in my heart. I find a space, find an excitement, find a passion to give something in some way back to the community. When you find that, uh, you've accomplished step number one. Uh, stay tuned for the rest of the steps. Same bat time, same bat channel. Para o que